Hello and welcome to another episode of The Interval. Today we are joined by Megan Wells of Megan Wells Guitars and Mandolins based in Forestville, California. This has to be one of my favourite interviews to date. Megan gives us a very candid, in-depth look into her career in Luthery, so much so that we've had to split it up over two episodes. So here's part one. We'll see you at the end. Okay, so um, I wanted to know, like I... I want to kind of go right back to the beginning with Megan. I want to know, like, let's talk about let's talk about the inception. Let's talk about the beginnings, not just the beginnings of Megan Wells guitars and mandolins, but Megan Wells the person. I want to know um, where did you grow up? Where are you, where are you from? Tell us, give us a bit of that kind of detail. Okay. Uh, well, I was born and raised in Michigan. Um, I spent the first 18 years of my life in Michigan, um, and I, uh, I think I was a weird little kid looking back on it, you know, I'm like, and I don't, the people who've known me my whole life say that I haven't changed that much, you know, they're like, wow, you're exactly the same as you were when you were three years old, you know, and uh, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but um yeah, Consistency I, is good, I think. Right? I guess so. I guess so. Um, uh, but yeah, I was uh, I was a guitar player pretty much by the age of seven. Mm. Um, I um, and I was also starting to see signs of you know falling in love with working with tools and um, just through. I mean, my parents weren't woodworkers or anything like that, but they were. DIYer kind of folk so um you know so I I when I was little I started working with a chainsaw with my dad helping down cut down trees um and uh in our front yard and um you know helping my mom clear out the kitchen tile with a chisel um things like that um so and then and I was also just, you know, playing guitar in my room, um, probably nothing good or anything like that. But uh, and I uh, I was pretty obsessed with playing guitar. It was kind of up until I started building. That was my one passion was was playing music and um I never wanted to be like a rock star or anything like that, but I just, it was all I wanted to do was play guitar. And, um, and then in high school, I started taking woodworking classes and welding classes and and I was just like, Oh my gosh, this is the, I, I loved it. I would, I'd skip chemistry and biology, but I never skipped woodworking, (laughs) you know, Mm -hmm. that was, um, uh, and it was pretty much right out of high school that I pretty, I decided that, well, it wasn't a decision to be a guitar maker. It was, uh, a, a realization of a calling, you know, I, I never felt like I decided this is what I wanted to do. It was yeah. almost like realizing my, my curse and my blessing, like all in one, it was like, this is. I, I don't have a, a choice. I felt like I was surrendering. Um, that's that's amazing. Like not many people get that. Like especially like at that age either. You know, to to have that like just inherent feeling. Do you have it, a sense of? Do you have any sense of like where that kind of came from? Like primarily, like. Well, I remember the exact moment. And it was pretty instant and it was pretty, I think it was the guitar at that point, I was 17 when I realized this and the guitar at that point had, other than my, my parents, I, I feel like the guitar had taught me more than anything else had ever taught me before about just how I wanted to navigate through the world and um, and how I felt about things. And, um, I felt like I owed the guitar my life and I really did. And I felt like, how can I give back to guitars? And, um, 
and how can I give back to the world? You know, because my dad was always telling me, you know, you need to um, leave, you know, give more than what you take, give more than what you take. And, and I was like, I need to give back to this instrument that um, has given me so much. And um, I had a Taylor guitar at the time and I was sitting on my bed and I was looking at the back of the headstock and every tuner on the back of the headstock said Taylor. And I was looking at it and I was like, wow, this has just got to be the most incredible feeling for Bob Taylor to look at this and see his name on every tuner. And yeah. then I was like, wait a minute, who's Bob Taylor? Like, <laughs> you know, I was like, who? but I knew his name from just being a guitar nerd my whole life. And that's when I was like, oh, my God, like people do this. And um Within a week, I was at uh, my local music store where I had kind of grown up and I was like, guys, like, I, oh my gosh, I, I, there's this thing, I got to do it. And they're like, oh, you want to be a luthier? And I was like, yeah, whatever, you know? And they're like, <laughs> they're like we keep one of those in the basement. <laughs> and there was. <laughs> they took me downstairs and there was this this guy named Scott Robertson who was fixing all the guitars and um I begged him to let me you know sweep his floors and just yeah. to you know polish the guitars all that stuff and um and he was the one who told me about uh about Gallup and okay. so it was kind of it just all happened kind of pretty quickly um but again so, uh, had you had you um so was your were you in a music was it a musical household like when when did you first what, what was your kind of first uh interaction with a guitar where did that where did that come from uh I so my dad's a drummer um he's uh, so I always grew up with him. I, I always, I was almost a drummer and maybe still kind of am a little bit. Um, right. whenever I'm there, I'm always playing on his drum kit. Uh, and so, and just, they're incredibly musical people. Um, okay. they're just, you know, I think my mom, when she was young, she, you know, dabbled with guitar, but I didn't grow up with there weren't guitars around until they got me a guitar for Christmas when I was seven. Um, and I was also, <laughs> I wanted to be like a, I was really into musicals. I thought at that point that I was going to be a Broadway star. I, I <laughs> you know, I, I, I was obsessed with telling um, stories through music. Yeah. And, and, and so I was, and I think they just kind of saw that as, and they've always told me that, you know, you can do anything you want. And um, so they got me a guitar and I, uh, I used to just sit in my room and just uh, listen to the Grease soundtrack and just strum and play and sit. And I wasn't playing anything. I mean, I was just, but it just, and then, um, and then when I was nine, we moved to England. And what? yeah, yeah. Uh, my dad got transferred to, to the UK. Um, How did I not already know this? Um, I did, think I, 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 did we talk I, about this in Vancouver? Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. <laughs> that was a long night. <laughs> it was, yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, we lived in King's Lynn. Oh, that's, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That rings a bell. Yeah, um, it was just for about a year and a half, but it was really there because I didn't have any friends, and at nine and ten years old, you know, kids aren't super kind to little chubby American girls coming in, <laughs> and, you know, and so I didn't have any friends, and so um I just started actually learning how to play the guitar and okay. and my dad had a friend there in England who started giving me lessons and um I started taking lessons at the local music store and I put a guitar on layaway so um it was just this kind of I don't know I mean it wasn't like my parents were guitar players and stuff it was just always I was surrounded by music it always inspired me and I um and 
and during that time in my life, it was really all I had. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that's kind of the story there. Okay. So, um, but then obviously, presumably, presumably, you ended up back in the States mm-hmm. and, and you wound up in, in the hanging out in the music store and, and heard about the Gallup school. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're like 17, 18 at this point? Yep, it was 2005. Okay. And you were obviously, you know, spending a lot of time in a wood shop at school, mm-hmm. at high school. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so then applied to, to go to Gallup. Was that, the, was that the first entry point into actually making the guitars? Yeah, it was. Um, I, it was about a year wait to get into the school. Um, and so I spent that year in that music shop. Um, I, I got a job working sales uh, in the music store. And then all my free time was spent downstairs with Scott. And he was just showing me the basics, you know, set up, making nuts, intonating guitars. Um, so, but then was that, I, was that something that you were getting paid for or, or was it kind of like, just let me come and just, just please come and let me, let me hang out. Yeah, no, I didn't, I didn't get paid. And, but, uh, and I mean, he wasn't actually giving me any substantial war, you know, it wasn't yeah, like I was yeah, doing yeah. work for him. Uh, he just let me, <laughs> bug him constantly and and uh and uh you know he was the first person who was ever like don't do this do not do this you know (laughs) uh, which all of my greatest mentors anybody who's ever really cared about me has told me not to do this you know yeah um but I know he's very proud today and um so, but yeah, it wasn't, I, I wasn't getting paid. Um, but I was also actually at the time I was, yeah, so I was working at the music store and then I also had a little side gig at a, at a deli making sandwiches. Mm-hmm. Um, so just waiting to go to school and, um, yeah, yeah. And was, so that was this back in, uh, the Midwest or is this? Yeah, that was back okay. in Michigan still. Got it. Yeah. Got it. So you eventually enrolled with Brian. Mm-hmm. Tell me about that. Uh, it was pretty magical. Um, so I eventually, so I went in 2006 to Gallup yeah. School, and I took their six-month program. Mm-hmm. And um, it was just an hour and a half away from where I grew up. Okay. Um, so my sister actually lived in that town um and I had already actually through her she actually uh lived in the upstairs apartment um from Sam Gidry who's Mm -hmm. Brian's right hand man so I knew Sam you know I met Sam when I was like 15 and you know we and and then when I walked into Brian's school that day to for the tour he was like what are you doing here and I was like what oh, did, he not, did he not know did you not yeah. know that? Oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> and uh so he's he's basically the closest thing I have to a, a brother um yeah. truly truly you know I've known him for half more than half of my life now um and so so yeah I went to Brian's school and um the curriculum's pretty different now I believe because they just are growing exponentially um but at the time I made a uh an electric guitar a telecaster and then um a flat top guitar which is what I thought was you know I was like chasing the flat top dream I I had it the arch tops when I made an arch top at Brian's school which was the final instrument you made it after the flat top, it was a classical and then an arch top. And, um, I had never really, I never really played arch tops because I was always kind of told that like the music I play isn't the kind of music you play on arch top guitars. And, Mm -hmm. um, but like, I completely fell in love with the whole process of, of carving the plates and just uh, the, the color work and, and F holes and, and all of these, I was just like, this, and, and all of the hardware, I mean, there, it was just so, and I just completely fell in love with that process. And then, um, and then when I finished Brian's school, 
I, I, I remember I went home, I went back home and I was back in the repair shop and it was one night after everybody left and I was sitting there with my arch top and, um, I wrote my very first instrumental piece. Yeah. I had always been like a singer songwriter up until that point. And, um, but that was the very first time I ever wrote an instrumental piece on a guitar because I didn't want to hear myself. I wanted to hear the guitar and it just pulled this piece out of me that, um, you know, and it kind of just, it, it launched me in this, this, this direction that, uh, musically and um in terms of of what i wanted to to build uh i mean and it took me a few years to really settle on that part on okay i'm an arch top builder um yeah. but it just you know so it was the process that i fell in love with and then as a musician it just stole my heart uh so in it you know, and it was it was an incredible experience being out there in, in at Brian's school is like a magic land of I mean where you're just surrounded by other people who are just like I you know, who are even if they don't want the same exact goals as you, we're all working towards the same thing and um it's just it's it's an incredibly, incredibly special place. It's so, so you you were there for so it was this the six month a six month program. And and so how many people were you learning with at the time? How many of the students were there? I think there was 18 people at the school at the time. And you built all those instruments in that six month period. Mm-hmm. So, so that that to me is like incredible in itself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It is. And I mean, the so the way it was divided up every two months, it's like a, a two month cycle. So I went and it, like there were 18 students in the school, but I think there was maybe only, I don't know, I don't remember, but like it, it, not all of us were in the same point in the curriculum. So right. like, I showed up and like maybe 10 other people showed up at the same time. We built the electric guitar and the acoustic guitar. And then there were other people who had been there already and they were working on their classical guitar or their arch top guitar. And so every two months, um, people would cycle out and new people would cycle oh, in. Oh, got it. So we weren't all, not everybody is at the same place. Um, and which kind of could be more complicated, you know, really. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. At that time, we only had one teacher. Now they have different teachers for different, you know, we got like Sam teaches the finger style uh, guitar and, you know, someone else teaches the arch top class. But at that time, there was just one guy who was managing all of us. Um, but I mean, the way that shop was set up even then, I mean, it was just streamlined to where we would all just went through and it, and it, and everybody got their guitars done and, yeah. you know, it's, um, it's, it's kind of hard then because when you leave that place, it's like, well, yeah. shit, what am I going to do now? <laughs> well, you know, like there's not many <laughs> shops like that on the planet. You know, so mm-hmm. it's kind of hard in that, mm-hmm. you know, like going from Brian's shop to virtually anywhere else is kind of right. a bit of an adjustment. But, um, you know, it definitely set a, stand, a standard. So. So, so, and did you, uh, I read somewhere that uh, you did the, the, the kind of the intro, like the introductory course. And then did you do like a master's? Did you mm-hmm. stay on and do some extra stuff there as well? Well, the master's program, that's what the six month program oh, is. Oh, got it. Okay, so got it. I, when I initially signed up, I, I, I just did the two month pro, I signed up for the two month program. And, um, and then as the time started going by waiting for it, I was like, whoa, eight weeks is nothing, you know? Yeah. And that's when I was, you know, I was 17, so I didn't realize, you know, I'm like, wow, eight weeks goes by real fast. Like, (laughs) and so so at some point I called and was like, I would love to, if there's an opening, I would love to, you know, do the the master's program instead. And um, which 
that would have changed everything if I would have never built that arch top, you know? Mm-hmm. So, but, but yeah, I just did his, that six month program is the master's program. So uh, that, that was, that was all I did. So when I was, when I completed that, I, I was, I was, I was done there. So. And so, so you, you completed, um, you've done all this amazing work and had all this amazing experience. How are you feeling coming out of there? What was going through, what was going through your head? What was going to be the next step for you? (sighs) It was tough. (laughs) So much happened. Um, I was heartbroken leaving there to be totally honest. Um, I was, I had they while I was there, um, a recruiter from First Acts Custom Shop came to the school to uh, they were hiring people for their new apprenticeship program. And um, my teacher had overheard me say that I wasn't going to do an interview because I didn't think that, you know, I wasn't going to get the job. And he was like, you should do the interview just for practice. Mm-hmm. And. So I did the interview and they offered me a job and, um, and I was supposed to move to Boston like a week after I graduated from school, I had this gig lined up and, um, two days before I graduated from school, they called and said that the company was basically collapsing and they couldn't take me on anymore. And so this was in 2007, the economy you know, so, so I was pretty heartbroken, um, actually leaving Brian's, not just because of that, but just because, uh, you know, they just like release you back into the wild and it's like, yeah, where are my people, you know? Sure. Um, and, uh, I was 19 and, um, scared felt defeated I felt like I didn't still know anything you know I was like I still don't I can't I need and I didn't know well I I think I did know I I think I always knew that I the way I wanted to learn I've always learned best by having a teacher having someone show me Mm -hmm. whether that's the best way to do it or not I don't know because I'm still stunted by that sometimes I'm like now that I'm all alone I'm just like who who do I you know like yeah and I've never been this whole well let's just YouTube I don't I don't you know it's like it was hard enough for me this setup it's like (laughs) so it's like so I kind of I knew that I wanted to find a teacher, not just that I could take from, but someone that I could give to, you know, uh-huh. I wanted to, to me, it's been a give, give, it's not a take, take, it's a give, give. And I was willing to give everything. And I, 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 I think I know that, that that person was out there. I just didn't know where to find them or how to find them, you know? So, but you, but you did, right? Then took a while, took a yeah. long time, you know, um, it was hard. It was so hard, you know? So, so, okay. So you've come out, you've come out of Gallup and, and you've kind of come back, you've come back home. Um, how did you, how did you set about finding that person that, you know, just seeing your face right now, I can, I can, I can feel, almost feel those feelings that you were feeling then. Like, mm-hmm what um how how did you how did you put yourself out there and how did you create the opportunity that you ultimately created for yourself well um I I I immediately kind of just started calling people I was going through the back of acoustic guitar magazine at the time because they always had these ads um and of just different guitar builders and I remember I called Kathy Winger um, days after I graduated from Gallup and, uh, Mm -hmm. and, you know, and looking back on it now, I'm like, whoa, dude, like, I, 
I couldn't do that now. I feel like, you know, <laughs> like, I mean, I could call Kathy, but just sometimes, you know, pick up your phone and just call your hero like that. And just be yeah. like, hi, can I come work for you? And, and she told me to take the money I would use to move to California and to buy a bandsaw. And she was like, you can do this you don't need anybody else and and um but i knew that wasn't true like i knew i needed somebody else um and so but then while i was doing all of that sam said hey we got a call from joe naylor at reverend guitars which was an electric guitar company in detroit and they're hiring you should call them up and apply so I did. I called him up. I sent a resume. He said, come on down for an interview. So I drove to Detroit, which was about two hours away. And I did an interview and they hired me. And so I came home and said, mom, dad, I'm moving to Detroit. And they're like, okay. <laughs> so I, um, I actually spent the first month living in a hotel because I didn't have a place, you know? And right. so but then um, within a year there, I mean, 2008 in Detroit, not pretty. And yeah. um, Joe had to lay me off. Um, I wasn't even there for a year. And, you know, he felt terrible to lay me off. And his company was, you know, falling apart financially. And um, it's been resurrected and they were by and high now but you know and I, I just a couple of years ago he and I were talking about that moment like when he had to you know lay me off and I mean it I was that was so hard um and so I got laid off from Reverend and then um and then I called Andrew White who is a flat top builder in West Virginia and I called him up and I was like if you're looking for an apprentice or anything, you know, I would love to come out and see your shop and interview with you and see if something that <clears throat> And he said, okay. And so I went out to West Virginia, got the, got the, got the gig. Um, it was an unpaid apprenticeship. And so um, came back home. I was like, mom and dad, I'm moving to West Virginia for free. <laughs> and um, and I moved to West Virginia and I absolutely loved it. Um, so I, just, just to, just to jump in there, sure. um, what, what are mom and dad saying at this time? Like, because you're, you're kind of, I'm sensing you're their like free spirited daughter, you know, <laughs> kind of like, are they, are they behind you? Are they supporting you? Or are they, are they kind of like, well, you know, it's the fun, we're in the financial, we're in the midst of a financial crisis. Are you sure you want to be doing the Luthery thing? You know, are you sure you want to move to Detroit? Like West Virginia, really? Like what, what's your support network like seeing it, you through all this, this, this period of. They, turmoil. my parents, I've got the best parents in the whole world. And they've always supported me. They've always supported this dream. Um, but they've also always been very honest with me. And, um, you know, at the first few months I was out, actually, uh, when I when I first went out to, oh, I think I, I went out a couple of times to West Virginia before I actually moved there. And one of those times was the, my dad went with me. And, um, I, and he went and he met Andrew and Andrew was, I was 20. He was 30. Mm -hmm. Young guy, you know, I don't think either of us knew what we were getting ourselves into. And, um, my dad told me that first night in West Virginia. And he was like, if you want my honest opinion, I don't think you're going to be here for a year. And, you know, I, I didn't listen. I was like, no, I'm going to be here forever. And, <laughs> you know, oh. and he's like, I'm just telling you, I don't think that this is the right place for you. It's a great opportunity and I think you should go for it, but you should be prepared. I don't think you're going to be here for a year. And he was right. And, um, you know, after the first few months, they were 
my, my, they were paying my $400 rent, which was I'm like, wow, where are those days? You know, yeah. but not for them paying rent, but 400 bucks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then after a few months, he was like, my dad was like, if you're going to do this, like you need to go get a, a job you know, this is not the way you don't just get to go and sit and glue things together all day long. And, you know, if you need to go get a job. So I went and got a job at uh, Qdoba, which is a, a a Mexican grill. It's like uh, Chipotle or something. Yeah. I was with burritos, you know, yeah. um, <laughs> I uh, was rolling burritos part time, uh, working for Andrew and, you know, and yeah, they were, they were always supportive, but they were always a little like, <sighs> yeah, they were just never, they never hesitated to be honest with me. Um, they didn't, but th they, but they knew too. They knew that I was going to do it no matter what. Nothing yeah. stopped me. So it's kind of like, <clears throat> But they were always incredibly, incredibly supportive. That's what um, but yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> so, so um, things didn't go quite as planned at, uh, in, in West Virginia for, for whatever reason. Um, and then, but eventually you did end up in California. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And um, you ended up with Tom, right? Tom yeah. Rebecca. Yeah, yeah. And you were there for you were there for what five years? Yep, five years. Now that that must have been that was that that's massive, right? That must have been massive for you. Uh, I mean, I know I know it is, and I know how how dear Tom is to you, and and uh, you know he's he's your mentor, and um, but that that's got to be like the real foundation of of Megan Wells right there tell I me tell, yeah. Tell, yeah tell me a little bit about that um well i met tom through i i i started immediately going to guitar shows um even even like it, it was there was a few months before i um moved out to west virginia um i went to a guitar show uh, in Miami, Florida. And I, I had the gig with Andrew, but I was kind of just getting everything together to move. But so he was like, yeah, I'm doing this guitar show in Miami, the Newport guitar show. Um, and so I went to Miami, that was in 2008 or something, I think 2008. And um, I, and that's where I met Tom. And uh, it was just like this, we just, connected so hard and like and I remember I remember Andrew kind of being like you know she spent all her time sure. on her, you know and like and at night when everybody's going out and having a good time you know um I just kept ending up with Tom and just having a riot just yeah. laughing so hard. I mean I've always felt like I found another alien from the same planet you know and we just instantly connected and um I uh I so that's how we met and then after at that at that point Stuart Day was working for Tom mm -hmm. and I had known Stuart because he was apprenticing at Brian's school when I was a student so he and I had always stayed in touch and so when my gig with Andrew was up, he told Tom and Tom called me um, and he said, first of all, are you OK? And I, I wasn't, you know, mm -hmm. I was not OK. I had been knocked off my horse so many times, like hard. Yeah. And I. And I, and I wasn't okay. And, um, and he said, well, I don't know what the future holds, but I would like to get you out here within the next year. Um, and so I spent the next nine months um, saving up my money so I could buy a car that would get me out to California. And um, 
in November of 2009, I drove out here and uh, I have been in paradise ever since, you know, um, those, the five years with him were some of the best years of my whole life. Wow. I, it was just, I found him. I found him. I found my mentor, you know? Yeah. And it was the one who wanted to give me as much as I wanted to give him. And even though I've now been out of his shop for as long as I was there, you know, like we still have that. Like I chased his, I was like chasing him down in the LMI parking lot yesterday because I found out he was here and leaving. And I was like, Tom, I need to get a hug, you know, like it's, it's a forever thing, you know. Uh, and that's what I was always looking for. Um, and that's what I, I had seen a trend of that in the history of arch tops. Uh, mm -hmm, of course. And I remember reading about that. I remember reading about like I did like this. Andrew wanted me to do like a report on arch tops at one point because he was thinking about getting into them. So I did all this research on all the history of arch tops. And I was just like, oh, like just like a box of tissues and like a book on D'Angelico, you know, just like, oh my gosh, this is the most beautiful. This is what it's about, you know? And I, uh, I found like, I found, I found, I found him. And, um, uh, and it was, it was great. It was everything you wanted it to be, which doesn't mean that it's all perfect and beautiful. It was hard and difficult, oh. you know, that dynamic is constantly changing. And, um, but he's a pro at that too. He's not just a professional guitar builder. He's a professional mentor. Um, he's been teaching people his whole life. So he understands it more than anybody. And I'd be lost without him. I'd be lost without him. Wow, that's incredible. That's 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 so wonderful. And I can just, just hear in your voice just how, how special that was for you. Um, but obviously, you know, all, all good things come to an end and it came to it came a point when it was time to to fly the coop. What what uh, tell me about that? What happened there? Well, that was <laughs> also you know, it's all cycles and that leaving Tom's was one of the hardest things that I've ever done. And it that was the end of a beautiful chapter basically because of finances um mm -hmm. we both were in really pretty awful positions financially and um i i it i didn't work for him for free um sure. but it also wasn't for a really livable amount of money and but i didn't i didn't care and he would have given me more if he could mm -hmm. and and he did give me more not not money exactly, but you know, the value was enormous. Um, but it, it we, we just, we reached a point where it was clear that like, I needed to go get a job. Uh, I was in so much debt for a 26 year old, you know? Um, and I, I had to leave and that I was, the, the, the few years following that were were harder than the few years leading up to Tom's um, because I was like, what? Like, I thought I did everything I was supposed to do, you know? I, and I was building my own guitars, but they weren't selling. I had no money coming in. I had done a few shows. I was in an enormous amount of debt. I was trying to build my shop at home. I was like, mm -hmm. I'm so like, and I was like, this isn't, this isn't going to happen. This yeah. isn't going to happen. Wow. Yeah, it was hard. I was yeah. a little wood chip for a long time, you know. And I was, so I started working at a coffee shop. And, um, and I pretended like I didn't tell anybody that I had been studying guitar making my, my whole 
little life, you know, I didn't tell anybody. I was like, they're just gonna, and it was in this town that I had already been living in for a few years. And they were like, who are you? Did you just move here? (laughs) No, I've just been right up there. I just never leave, you know? And and then I was like, wait a minute, like, maybe I can make friends. Maybe. One of those. Yeah, I know, (laughs) you know, and like. I want one. (laughs) They're they're great, you know, they're like, and then I was like, I need to find out whether these people would still like me. Because that was like, I was in this phase, I was like, what if I, what if I didn't build guitars anymore? Would people still like me? You know, I felt like everyone in my life only, you know, paid attention to me because that's what I did. And it got to a point where that didn't feel good either, you know? And so, so I got to connect with my community in my town and, um, and it, they taught me all these other things about myself that I didn't even know were there uh, just by being a normal person, just out there in the world, interacting with people. Um, and uh, they really held me up. They held me up. And just, it, it, it yeah, yeah. So I was at that coffee shop for about four years, you know, mm. and um and were you, were you kind of, were you doing, were you building as well? Or were you just kind of like, I'm going to put that on the back burner just for a little while and kind of find out who I am at this point in my life after kind of like chasing the guitar thing hard since right. like 17? Because I guess it's like all of your adult life up until this point, it's like a guitar and, and chasing that guitar dream um so so were, were you building at the at the time like did you what what was you know when you were when you were working in the cafe as well yeah I was um about three guitars a year um yeah. flat tops mm-hmm. um and uh yeah I was just climbing my way out of debt and finding a way to build without this enormous pressure of, because even though, even though my guitars weren't selling and all of this and that, I mean, the spotlight was huge. And I, I didn't, I didn't like that. You know, I didn't like the fact that like people were like, Oh my gosh, like, you know, she's building these amazing guitars. And it was like, actually, they're not that great. I have a long way to go. And I could say that all day long. And people were, it's like, they didn't even, they're just like, oh, ha, ha, Megan, whatever, you know, like, you're, and I'm like, no, I'm serious. Like, I still have a lot of work to do. Who were, the, who were these people? Were these just like people around you? You're kind of people around you, your friends, or was it, was it, was it guitar people? Who were these the guitar people you know and the social media community of just you know and and then I'd go to these guitar shows and the people would you know they I think they were just so excited to have a little bit of diversity in the mix that they kind of over glorified it you know and they kind of hoisted me up on their shoulders before I was ready and Mm -hmm. You know, and it was like, uh, and so, and that was also kind of crushing me. I was just like, this, people were saying that I was great before I really felt like I was. And that didn't, I didn't want that. You know, I was didn't. That, was that feeling though? Do you think, how much of that do you think was down to imposter syndrome? Like, do you think there was any of that going on? Totally, totally. But it wasn't like, I wasn't trying for that you know what I mean it's just it was naturally people were kind of doing that to me like I felt like I was like running this race all by myself for my own reasons Mm -hmm. and then you kind of look up and you look around and you've got like all these people around me like yeah go Megan go and you're like oh well cool I didn't all right thanks guys thanks and then you keep going you keep going (laughs) and then people and then people just get they're like ah and then I'm like 
And then I'm like, and then I feel like they've got like a gun to my head, like, go, Megan, go. You keep going. You keep going. And I'm like, okay, yeah. I was gonna, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you think I've been doing for the last 10 years? <laughs> I like, you know, and it was like, just, I just needed the, it was so, and it was also like, okay, if you guys think I'm so great, then why don't you buy a guitar? Because my phone is blowing up with debt collectors every 10 minutes. Like, this i'm i'm hurting in a lot of other ways here that like when i was younger i said i wouldn't care about and people warned me that i might mm -hmm. and as you grow up those you know those priorities change and certain realities you can't ignore anymore and um you know so i i really just kind of wanted to build behind the scenes I, I didn't want this attention or this pressure because I was so lost and I and I was still so grieving my my time at Tom's you know mm -hmm. it it really really took me a long time to to move move past that um so I still I kept building I definitely kept building and I even started going back to guitar shows while I was working at the coffee shop. I started um, displaying at a few shows again and kind of plugging back into the community. Um, but anybody who knew me before that time thought that I was gone because I, I totally unplugged for a few years and was just like, leave me alone. I'll be back when I'm as good as you think I am. And yeah, yeah. It was hard. I was sad. Wow. But wow. So what, what kept you moving forward? You know, I, I'm already getting the sense, like, you're, an inc you're obviously an incredibly driven woman um, to get this far. You've been kind of handed a raw deal in so many uh, instances, and uh, you're already facing what is an uphill struggle, wanting to be a luthier in the first place. So what, what kept pushing you forward? Well, those you remember, I said this wasn't a choice. Thanks so much for joining us for part one. Don't forget to subscribe and tell all of your friends. Hit that five-star rating. You can also find us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok now as well. And uh, we look forward to joining you for part two. See you soon.